Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste we move forward with our discussion on forest soils and today we will look at the kinds of soils that we have or the major soil types the classification of soil types. The first question that arises is why do we need to classify the soils? Well there are two reasons one soils tell us about the history of a place as we saw in the previous lecture soil formation is dependent upon parent rocks relief topography climate and time. So, the kind of soil that is present in an area can give you an idea about what kind of parent rocks are there, what was the relief of this area, what was the topography of this area when the soil was formed, what was the climate of this area and probably also how long has it taken for this soil to be formed in this particular area. So, we can have uh, a good uh, discernment about the past history of different areas if we study the soils. Also the classification of soils is important because soil regulates the plant life. So, when we are doing silviculture, when we are raising a forest crop then we need to know what kinds of crops can we raise in different areas. So, the question is whether or not our particular species can be grown in the area of interest. So, there are some species that for instance may require a well drained soil. There could be some other species that require a soil that retains a lot of moisture probably even a water locked soil. So, if we see the soil of an area we can make an inference about what kind of species can be grown in that area. So, that permits us to avoid the failures that uh, that were possible if we did not know about the correlation between different species and the soil types of the area. So, we can get an idea about the vegetation that will be supported in different areas. Now, soil classification is so important that from very early on in our civilization we have had different kinds of classifications and one of the earliest classifications divided soils into two categories. Urvara soil and the Usara soil. Urvara, Urvara soil is a fertile soil, Usar soil is a sterile soil. So, if there is a soil that can support a wide variety of plants then it is a fertile soil, if it cannot support then it is an infertile soil. So, this is a very rudimentary classification and does not serve our purpose to quite an extent because this classification does not tell us a lot about the qualities that are there in the soil. So, you can be having an oozer soil and probably that soil is oozer because it is not having enough amount of water. So, if you uh, give it irrigation probably it will be able to raise the crops or there could be an oozer soil which is deficient only in one particular mineral say it is having a, a lack of potassium. So, you can very easily convert it into an urvara soil by adding potassium, but then just by telling that this soil is an oozer soil does not give us any management inputs that we could make use of. Another early classification is on the basis of texture. So, as we saw before we can have sandy soils, we can have silty soils, we can have clay soils or we can have loamy soils. Now, in this classification the loamy soil is considered to be the best kind of soil because it has uh, enough amounts of sand, silt and clay and so it is able to support a wide variety of plants. Another early classification was on the basis of color. So, what does the soil look like? Is it a red colored soil? Is it a yellow colored soil? Is it a black colored soil? But here again we can gain some correlations about the properties of the soil, but this classification does not tell us a lot about the properties of the soil. And so we moved to the modern classification. Now, the modern term classification classifies the soil on a number of bases. It classifies it on the basis of 
its genesis or how, how the soil originated, the color of the soil, the composition of the soil, the location of the soil. And if we know something about all of these different characteristics of the soil, then the other characteristics that have been left out can very easily be discerned. So, for instance, if you know that a soil is an alluvial soil, then you will uh, uh, then you can make an inference that probably it is very near to a water body or probably this is a very fine soil that has been deposited over time and this soil has enough amounts of clay and this soil supports these many species of plants and so on. So, on the basis of genesis, color, composition and location, we divide soils into 8 different categories. So, we have the alluvial soil, black soil, red and yellow soil, laterite soil, arid soil, saline soil, peaty soil and forest soil. And we will look at each of these in more detail now. <coughs> So, let us begin with alluvial soils. So, alluvial soils are depositional soils, they are transported and deposited by rivers and streams. So, how so we are talking about the genesis of these soils and what are the locations in which these soils are found. So, if you consider a hill and on this hill there is a stream that is flowing and then it this stream gets into the plain areas. Now, when this stream is moving in the mountainous regions, then it has a greater speed, because it has a, a large slope on which this stream is flowing. Now, if you have water that is flowing at a great speed, in that case it will be able to retain a lot amount of sediments, which will move along with the stream. So, basically we were having some weathering that occurred in these areas. There was also some erosion that happened and all of these sediments are now moving with the water, because it is moving at a faster speed. But then when it enters into this plain areas, so now the speed of the river has come down. It has earlier it was moving on a huge slope, now it has come to a flat region. So, when it moves from this, uh, from this steep slope to a flat region, the speed now reduces. Now, when the speed reduces, it uh, the the uh, the capacity of the stream to carry the sediments also reduces. So, what happens then? The stream then leaves out these sediments. So, these sediments now just settle down and the water is moving above them. Now, these sediments get deposited in these areas in the flood plains and these sediments form the alluvial soil. So, what is the genesis of the alluvial soil? It is a soil that is formed through transportation and deposition by streams and rivers. So, where will you commonly find these alluvial soils? You will find them in river valleys and you will find them in deltas, because uh, in these regions the speed of the water is very slow. Now, these alluvial soils in terms of texture they can be sandy loam or they can even be clay. Now, typically they will be sandy loam in these areas in this area, because early on the sandy loam will be deposited by the river and in the far off areas it will be more of a clay composition, because uh, if we had only fine particles they will only be able to be moved to the later on stages. So, sandy loam in the earlier areas, clay soil in the later areas downstream. These soils are rich in potash, but are poor in phosphorus and there are two kinds of alluvial soils. You have khadar and you have bangar. Now, khadar is the new alluvium, which is deposited by the floods annually and bangar is the old alluvium, which was deposited away from the flood plains in historical times. Now, these soils may have kankar deposits. What is kankar? Kankar is calcium carbonate. So, in a number of our hills, we have calcium carbonate and that also gets moved along with the uh, streams and this kankar is also deposit al uh, deposited along with the alluvial soils. So, in this case, we can say that the amount of calcium that is present in this soil is also uh, substantial. 
the color varies from light gray to ash gray these are fertile soils and these are intensely cultivated so they are very fertile soils and in a number of areas you will find that the forests that were growing on these soils have been cut and these lands have been converted for agricultural use in india these soils are widespread found in northern plains and in the river valleys next have a look at the black soils black soil is also known as regor soil or black cotton soil because it is black in color and it is used for the cultivation of cotton these are clay soils and these are deep and uh, and impermeable soils now because they have a, a large um, deposit uh, a large amount of clay they are impermeable as we saw in the last lecture that uh, because clay has very uh, fine sized particles and very uh, less number of pores so in uh, or, or less uh, quantity of pores so in uh, so that makes it an impermeable soil so if you put water on it probably the water will form a puddle these soils have a high swell shrink character what is this swell shrink character they swell and become sticky when they are wet and they shrink when they are dried so so depending on the amount of water that is there the volume of the soil changes a lot and this gives them self plowing character since large cracks develop in the summer season so when these soils become dry the volume reduces and that leads to the the development of cracks and in these cracks the water can very easily reach inside and so these cracks facilitate the absorption of water permitting rain fed agriculture and cotton is widely cultivated these soils are rich in lime iron magnesium and potassium and they generally lack phosphorus nitrogen and organic matter so if you want to raise crops in these soils you will probably have to add phosphorus nitrogen and organic matter the color varies from deep black to gray and in india they cover most of the deccan plateau next we have the red and yellow soils these soils develop in low rainfall areas with crystalline igneous rock bed so the kind of parent material is crystalline igneous rocks and the climate is a low rainfall area the red color is due to the presence of iron and when you add water to it when it becomes hydrated it becomes yellow in color these are fine grained soils that are fertile and the coarse grained soils amongst these will be poor in fertility they are deficient in nitrogen phosphorus and humus and are commonly found in eastern part of the deccan plateau so uh, they will be commonly found in areas like odisha and andhra pradesh next we have laterite soils now the term later is derived uh, uh, it is a latin word that means brick so these soils are are mainly used in the construction of bricks now if you have a soil that is mainly used for brick making and not for agriculture you can make an inference that this soil does not have a good amount of fertility otherwise why would somebody want to use it for brick making so these soils have poor fertility they develop in areas with high temperature and rainfall now if you have high temperature and high amount of rainfall any amount of organic matter that is there in these soils will very easily or and very quickly get degraded because of the microorganisms because you have ample amount of water and you have high temperatures so generally the amount of organic matter in these soils will be very less and also there is an intense leaching of minerals due to the tropical rains so you have high temperatures you have high amount of rain and so a number of minerals that were found in these soils are are constantly getting leached out it removes lime and silica while iron oxide and aluminum compounds are left so iron oxide and aluminum are left which gives it the reddish color humus content is fast removed by bacteria and so you have the the soil that is poor in organic matter and if it is poor in organic matter typically it will also be poor in nitrogen and it is also poor in phosphorus and calcium it is rich in iron oxide and potassium 
it can only be put to agricultural use through application of manure and fertilizers. It is commonly found in higher areas of peninsular plateau in the states of Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh and Odisha. So, these are the characteristics of the laterite soil. Next we have arid soils. Now, the term arid means dry. So, these are dry soils. When you talk about a dry soil, you can think about the state of Rajasthan in which you will be having huge quantities of these arid soils. So, if you think about Rajasthan, the first thing that gets into your mind is the sand. So, these are sandy soils and typically they are highly saline as well. So, when you, you say saline soil, it means that it has large amounts of salt in it, typically because uh, there is little amount of rainfall to wash it away. So, these are sandy soils, which are generally saline as well. They have red to brown color, they lack moisture and humus and they are also low in nitrogen. The lower horizons can have concurred layers, which makes it impermeable and thus when water is made available, the plants can thrive. So, what happens with these soils is that if you look at the soil horizons, then here you have the sand. But then below this will be a layer of concurred nodules. So, these are the calcium carbonate nodules. And because of these concur nodules, if you add water to this soil, then you will have water that gets localized into this area, because this layer is impermeable. And so, if you add water to these soils, you can use it for the cultivation of crops, even forest crops. So, when water is made available, plants can thrive. It is extensively found in the states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Next, we have saline soils. Saline soil is a soil that has a huge quantity of salt. Now, because it has large quantities of salt, it is generally infertile. Now, why is it infertile? It is infertile because when you have a huge quantity of, of salt in the soil, then water is not uh, getting absorbed by the roots because of the osmotic pressure. So, because of osmosis, the uh, uh, you have a, a salty brine that is outside and the root cells are unable to absorb water because of osmosis. So, these are infertile soils with high salt content. Now, when you talk about salt, the general salts are sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride and so these soils will be rich in sodium, potassium, magnesium and often they are a result of dry climate and poor drainage. So, again you have salts, if you have enough amount of water, if you have good drainage, then these salts will get washed away, but then if you have salt, then typically you have a dry climate and you have a poor drainage, because of which the salts are not getting washed off. And they occur in arid and semi arid regions and in water logged and swampy areas. May also be a result of sea water intrusion or deposition of salt particles through wind or excessive use of fertilizers. So, these are three other ways in which these soils can get formed. So, this is the genesis of these soils, they can be because of sea water intrusion or deposition of salt particles through air or excessive use of fertilizers. And once these salts are there, if you have less quantity of water, if you do not have a good drainage, these salts are going to stay, because they are not getting washed away. Next, we have PT soils. Now, a PT soil, when you think about a PT soil, you should think about organic matter. So, this is a soil that has a huge quantity of peat in it a huge quantity of organic carbon in it. So, PT soils are found in areas of high rainfall, high humidity and lots of vegetation. So, you have a good amount of rainfall. So, there is a profuse growth of vegetation. When there is a profuse growth of vegetation, you will also have a profuse amount of leaf litter that is falling on these soils. 
and if there is an n oxid condition you do not have sufficient oxygen in that case these this leaf litter will not get fully degraded and it will remain in the soil and gen and gradually convert it into a pt soil so you have dead organic matter that accumulates giving a black color to this soil the organic matter content in the soil may be as high as 50% it may be alkaline in ph and it is commonly found in bihar west bengal odisha tamil nadu so pt soil areas of heavy rainfall profuse growth of vegetation uh, lots of deposition of dead leaves which are not getting degraded typically because of an anoxic condition or because of uh, alkalinity in the soil then we have forest soils now remember that in all these different kinds of soils you can have forests but then typically most of these soils have been put into other uses so for instance in the case of laterite soil it is being used to make bricks in the case of alluvial soil it is being used for agriculture and so we hardly have any forests that are seen in these soils so but in the case of the forest soils because we have we do not have much other uses for them so the forests are still found there so forest soils are found in forest areas with sufficient rainfall the structure and the texture vary according to the local environment so this is not a soil classification in which you can very easily tell the characteristics the only characteristic that you can probably say is that it is not a very fertile soil because of which it has not been put for agricultural uses in upper reaches it may be coarse grained in valley sides it may be loamy and silty so you cannot make a very uh, good prediction about the forest soils now this was one classification another modern classification is the uh, classification by the us department of agriculture the usda classification now in this classification the soils are divided into 12 soil orders and we'll have a look at these soil orders so the first order is alfi soil l is aluminium fi is iron so these are the soils that have high aluminium and iron content they are moderately leached soils with high fertility now when we talk about uh, soils that are rich in iron and aluminium even our red and yellow soils and our laterite soils are rich in iron uh, compounds but then in the case of alfi soils we have a moderate amount of leaching so this is because you you do not have intense rainfall in these areas and so you have a moderately leached soil and so the fertility is high nd soil so it comes from the japanese term endo which means black soil so nd soil is the soil is the soil that is uh, formed out of volcanic ash it is black in color and it is a very nascent soil next you have arid soils again arid is dry weather so arid soil is a soil that is uh, a dry soil and as we have seen before it will be having a conker layer nt soil nt soil is a soil of recent origin developed in unconsolidated parent material and uh, a good example is the soils that are forming in steep slopes you do not have any horizon development just a single a layer now if you remember a layer is the top soil layer uh, in the soil uh, in the soil profile the soil horizons are named as o as the organic layer a is the top soil b is the subsoil c is the substratum and r is the bedrock now these soils only have an a layer which means that they they do not have organic materials in them now these soils are found in steep slopes so when you have any amount of weathering then probably because of the action of water or because of the action of winds these soils and also because of the action of gravity these soils come down here and then they get deposited now in this weathering like situation you only have the mineral matters so you have the mineral deposits these are recently formed these have not moved to any other area you do not find any trees on them and so the organic layer is not developed so you do not have an o layer you only have a single a layer there is no horizon development and these are the soils of recent origin 
developed in unconsolidated parent material. So, in these soils you do not have any water that is consolidating these into a more denser aggregate. Next you have jelly soils, it comes from the word from the Latin word gelaire which means to freeze. So, these are soils that are found in the permafrost regions, permafrost regions are those regions that are permanently uh, frozen. So, you will find them in the upper reaches of mountains or you will find them uh, towards the poles. Now, these jelly soils they typically will be having very little microbial activity, very little amount of organic activity, because of the low temperatures there is hardly any growth of materials and these soils typically remain frozen. Next you have histosols, it comes from the Greek histos which means tissue, which means that we are talking about an organic material. So, these are soils that are composed mainly of organic materials example is peat. So, we saw peaty soils before and these peaty soil soils in the USDA classification are known as histosols and because you have a huge amount of organic material. So, this is also a good storehouse of carbon. Next you have incepti soils. Now, incepti soil comes from the Latin word inceptum which means beginning. So, these are again soils that are not very much developed, these are at a beginning or a nascent stage. They have minimal horizon development, but more than anti soils. They are found on steep slopes, young surfaces and on resistant parent materials. So, these are very similar to the anti soils, but in the case of anti soils you did not have any horizon development. In this case you have some amount of horizon development that is the only difference. They are also found in the steep slopes or young surfaces and on resistant parent materials. So, if you have a parent material that is very hard, so in that case the weathering will take a huge amount of time and the small amount of weathering that has happened in these soils that will uh, uh, th that has happened in these rocks will lead to uh, the development of a very nascent soil and that will also be known as the incepti soil. Next we have molly soils. Mollisol comes from the Latin word mollis, which means soft, and these are soils of the grassland ecosystems and these are widely used in agriculture. So, the mollisols you can think about the alluvial soils which are soft and which are fertile. Now, these soils mollisols they are the grassland soils. Now, grass as we know uh, uh, when we talk about our staple foods, whether we talk about rice or wheat. Uh, all of these are uh, belong to the grass family or poesy. So, a soil that can support grasses will also be able to support these staple crops, so, because of which uh, most of these soils have been converted in for agricultural uses. So, the molly soils have largely been used for agriculture, because they are the soils of the grassland ecosystems. Next we have oxy soils which comes from the French word oxide, it means an oxide. These are soils that are rich in iron and aluminum oxides and these are highly weathered soils with extremely low native fertility. So, here we are talking about those soils that are having iron and aluminum in the, in the form of oxides. These are heavily uh, leased soils and they have less fertility. So, you, you can very easily correlate it with the laterite soils that we saw in the Indian classification. So, they are known as oxy soils. Next you have spodosols, which comes from the Greek word spodos which means wood ash. Now, these soils are acidic soils with subsurface accumulation of humus complex with iron and aluminum and these support forests. Now, spodosols because it comes from the word wood ash. So, typically you can see that uh, that these will form in areas that already have forests. Now, because you have forests, you will have an accumulation of humus and typically this humus will be there on the subsurface complex with iron and aluminum, which means that you are having some amount of um, alluvi alluviation in these soils. Next we have ulti soils, it comes from the Latin word ultimus, which means last. So, this is a soil at a very last stage. 
So, this is strongly leached acidic forest soil with low fertility and it is generally red in color. So, ulti soils because it is the last soil, so everything that was there has already been leached out, there is hardly any fertility that is left because there are hardly any minerals or uh, uh, hardly any uh, fertilizing minerals that are left. All of these have been leached out, these soils are acidic forest soils with low fertility, generally red in color because again here. Uh, iron and aluminum oxides will be prevalent. Next we have vertisols, so it comes from the Latin word verto which means to turn. So, these are the soils that turn themselves, they are clay rich soils that shrink and swell with changes in the moisture content and have self flowing capability. So, in the Indian classification we refer to them as the black cotton soils or the rigor soils. So, in this lecture, we saw why uh, a classification of soils is important. We began with the classification of soils and we said that classification of soil is important for two purposes. One, you have an idea of what species can be raised in any particular site. Two, you have an idea of what was the, uh, uh, what was the historical condition in that particular site, what was the climate, what was the topography, what are the parent materials out of which these soils have been formed. At the same time, you can make a number of deductions about the qualities of these soils. So, for instance, if you have a soil that uh, you see that it is a black cotton soil. So, as soon as you see that it is a black cotton soil, you can make an inference a rainy season, then this soil will become very sticky. Whereas, when it is a uh, uh, the summer season and then this soil will be having a number of cracks in it. Now, with this information suppose you want to uh, have your silvicultural operations or you want to raise a forest plantation in this soil. So, what will you do? You have this area and this area has black cotton soil. Now, the question is when are you going to dig your pits, can you dig your pits in the rainy season? The answer is no, because as soon as you have the first rains, these soils will swell and they will become extremely sticky and they will be so sticky that it will be next to impossible to dig holes in these soils. These soils will stick to the boots, these soils will stick to the implements, they will stick to anything and everything. So, if you want to dig pits, these pits should be dug in the summer season. So, these pits will be dug in the summer season. Similarly, if you have a soil say if you have a lot of sandy soil in your area. Now, if you want to raise any plantations, so can you raise a plantation in a desert soil or a sandy soil? So, the answer is yes, because you know that there will be conquered nodules uh, at the bottom at you might even go for a few sampling in a few locations, but then because you know that there is an impermeable layer of uh, conquer nodules, so you can actually raise plantations in those areas. Similarly, if you have a region where you see that it has laterite soils, so because a laterite soil is heavily re leached, so probably you, uh, you will say that okay, if I need to raise a plantation in this area, I will need to supplement this soil with some nutrients. So, when you are digging a your pits here, you will also be adding fertilizers into it. If you have an alluvial soil, then you will say that okay, this area has, uh, has enough amount of water or it is uh, there in a delta area or it is uh, in the river valleys. The soil is soft, I can very easily dig holes, but you know that because this soil is rich in clay, then probably this soil will also be prone to erosion. So, in that case you will uh, uh, you will perform your pit, uh, your pit digging operations in a way that you are able to, uh, to reduce the amount of erosion that can be there in this area or for the same matter because you know that it is a clay soil it will not uh, allow water to get inside probably you would also uh, think about making some water harvesting sites in these areas. So, these are the kinds of inferences that you can make that will be useful uh, when you are raising the forest crops. So, we looked at 
different kinds of classifications. We looked at the earliest classifications, which just talked about whether a soil is fertile or whether it is infertile. So, a fertile soil is an urvara soil, uh, an infertile soil is an usar soil. Then there was a classification that was based on texture. Is it a clay soil? Is it a sandy soil? Is it a loamy soil? Is it a silty soil? And so on. Then one other early classification was on the basis of the color. So, whether it is a red soil, it is a black soil and so on. But then these early classifications gave you little information about the characteristics, about the genesis, about the composition of these soils. So, with time we moved to the modern classifications and we, we looked at two classifications. One was the Indian classification, the second is the USDA classification by the US Department of Agriculture. Now, in the Indian classification, we saw things like the alluvial soil, the sandy, uh, the arid soils, the saline soils, the black cotton soil, the laterite soil, the red and yellow soil, the forest soil and so on. And in the case of uh, the USDA classification, we have 12 different soil orders. Everything ends with a sol and most of the terms are derived from either Latin, Greek, Japanese or French words. So, once you know the, uh, the name of a soil, you can make inferences about how this soil was formed and what are the properties and that will be useful in making managerial decisions. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.